Welcome to the Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University. I'm Jennifer Bernardi. I'm the Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum here at Suffolk. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's discussion, our very first forum of the season, entitled Extreme Dog, What Right Do Our Pets Have to Be Saved? Uh, the Ford Hall Forum is proud to be the nation's oldest continuously operating free public lecture series. Thank you for participating in this century-old program to advance freedom of speech and advance an informed citizenry through public discussion. Uh, I want to thank our generous sponsors in the Boston community and beyond, including, among others, uh, the Lowell Institute, the Mass Cultural Council, and our partners at Suffolk University, which serves as the forum's home base. We also thank our members whose generosity makes this free public event possible. If you're not already a member, please feel free to visit the table uh, just outside of the theater uh, and join us. Uh, it is your support that keeps the forum alive, independent, and free to the public. So thank you very much. Uh, this event, like many of our programs, is being recorded uh, and will be available as a webcast on the WGBH Forum Network and on Forum.tv. Uh, if you are sharing a comment or a question, please use the microphone here or the microphone there when the time comes, not only so that you'll be heard, but so that you'll also be captured on video. Um, also, please understand that by speaking, you are giving the Fort Hall Forum permission for us to record you. And lastly, everyone, if you will, take a moment to turn off your cell phones if you forgot on your way in. Thank you. I am delighted to introduce our moderator for the evening, Fort Hall Forum board member, Monica Collins. Monica is the creator and writer of Ask Dog Lady, a humor and lifestyle column about dogs, life, and love that's syndicated to over 400 newspapers nationwide. Monica hosts the radio program Ask Dog Lady on WCAP 980 in the Merrimack Valley. She is a regular guest on the Callie Crossley Show on WGBH-FM in a continuing series called Pup Culture. Monica is also a communications consultant and media strategist for nonprofit organizations a former staff writer and media critic for USA Today and the Boston Herald. Monica has written for the Boston Globe and various magazines such as USA Weekend, Forbes Life, Executive Woman, Ladies Home Journal, and Vogue. Her canine use is Shorty. Uh, now as I turn the microphone over to Monica, please help me welcome her. Thank you everyone for coming to this discussion. It should be very interesting. When I first saw the title of tonight's lecture in print, Extreme Dog, What Right Do Our Pets Have to Be Saved? I was a little stunned and chagrined by the extremely awkward passive voice. As a writer, I try to stay away from passive voice. However, in the case of tonight's topic, I think it's very appropriate. Our dogs, so active when it comes to walking, sniffing, chasing the ball, making us laugh, and driving us crazy with their small passions, have entirely passive voices in matters of health and welfare. Domestic animals are wholly dependent on us their owners and keepers, to make life choices for them. What food they eat, what bed they sleep on, and where they go to die. The choices we make can haunt us or embolden us and give us hope. But wait a minute, come on, they're just dogs, right? Yeah, they're just dogs the way a heart is just a muscle. Tonight we ponder the worth of a pet, spiritually, emotionally, legally, healthfully, and medically. And we look at the extremes of caring for them, saving their lives, or letting them go. The panelists will offer their insights, and then we will be invited to join the conversation. Our panel is impressive and eminently qualified to chew over this provocative topic. Sorry, I needed to indulge in one little dog pun. <laughs> I want to thank Jen Benardi so much, the Executive Director of the Ford Hall Forum, and uh, Mary Curtin as well for doing great uh, outreach on this. 
and now I'm very, very pleased to introduce, I'm going to introduce all of them, and then each one will come up here to speak. I'm so pleased, to and I will introduce them in the order that they are to come up to speak here, or at the podium. John Ensminger. John Ensminger is an attorney, a writer, and a skilled dog advocate. He has a bifurcated work life. He is the author of Service, John Ensminger is the author of Service and Therapy Dogs in American Society, Science, Law, and the Evolution of Canine Caregivers, a very practical and helpful compendium you can purchase after the lecture. And he is the co-author of the treatise Money Laundering, Terrorism, and Financial Institutions. I don't mean to laugh about that, but it is very different subject matter. <laughs> Um, both published by the, as well as the newsletter, the USA Patriot Act Monitor, both published by the Civic Research Institute. Ensminger has been the chair of the Banking and Savings Institutions Committee of the American Bar Association Tax Section. He has also been editor-in-chief of the Journal of Taxation and Regulation of Financial Institutions. As a dog advocate, he reports on legal and scientific issues affecting skilled dogs at doglawreporter.blogspot.com. Ensminger and his dog, the outgoing Labradoodle, the outgoing Labradoodle Chloe, our, th our therapy dog team, who I believe is on the cover of the book, uh, our therapy dog team and regularly visit hospitals, elder care facilities, schools, libraries, and a Cerebral Palsy Institute. Joanne M. Lindenmeyer is an Associate Professor of Public Health in the Department of Environmental and Population Health at the Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine at Tufts University. Lindenmeyer has been a principal or co-principal investigator for several veterinary ventures, including USAID's Respond Project the largest award in the history of Tufts University. Lyndon Meyer's experience ranges from monitoring the health of Nigerian sheep, conducting studies using dogs as sentinels for Lyme disease, and working with the Vermont Department of Health and the CDC. She was the founding director of Brown University's MPH program, a member of the Veterinary Board School Board of Overseers, and is now a member of the Tufts Global Health Initiative. The canine members of her family include Mamba, a border collie pit bull, Cole, a black poodle, Lily, a basset hound beagle, and Muggsy, a mixed breed who resembles a miniature Benji. She also has two cats, Zipper and Orange, who are arch enemies. <laughs> and Dr. Nick Trout, Dr. Trout graduated from Veterinary School of the University of Cambridge, England. He is a diplomate of the American and European Colleges of Veterinary Surgeons and a staff surgeon at the prestigious MSPCA Angel Animal Medical Center in Boston, where he has now worked for over a decade. Trout is also a very talented writer who movingly tells stories of animals and people in distress. He is the author of two books about his life as a veterinary surgeon. The current Love is the Best Medicine, right here, also available after the lecture, has garnered glowing reviews and is a stirring story of two dogs and of the choices made for them by their loving owners. Dr. Trout has also written the New York Times bestseller, Tell Me Where It Hurts. He has two lucky dogs, Meg, a yellow Labrador, and Sophie, a Jack Russell Terrier. And now, John Ensminger, if you will address our topic. Thank you very much. Addressing the topic is a little difficult. 
because it's either too simple or too difficult. What rights do our animals have to have heroic measures taken to save them? Simplistically, none. Animals are property. And under the legal system, they remain property in most jurisdictions for most purposes. One writer, Stephen Weiss, who's looked at this quite a bit, had an analogy that I'm afraid is all too true. Your dog has no more right to have a heroic measure to save its life than your car has the right to go to a great mechanic or your suit that has gotten too small for you has the right to go to the greatest tailor. It just isn't there. That said, I don't think the law is static on this. I think the law is changing, and I think it's changing for the better. But rather than adding a lot of footnotes that would say for this or that situation in this or that jurisdiction or this or that court that what I have just said is overly simplistic, I'm going to look at it from the other perspective which I mean the perspective of the legal theoretician, the law professor, the employees of think tanks that look at animal rights. And there we get a different picture, though theoretical, not real at the moment, not for the most part real, but maybe some kind of indication of where we might be going. You have a dog, it has a serious condition, cancer. You take it to the veterinarian, one of our esteemed veterinarians, and you are told, we have an experimental study that indicates that a new technique has a good chance of success. That technique comes, fortunately for you, with relatively little pain to the dog but it's gonna set you back $100,000. Now, I don't want to cite a specific study. I'm really looking at maybe 20 or 30 papers that have been published in law reviews in the last decade, but there is a, a strain of argument that would say something like the following. Your relationship with your pet should not be one of ownership, but of guardianship. You should look upon this animal as something closer to a child or a partner or a friend, something else. And because of that different relationship, you should have a different level of obligation. Now, you can't know what the dog would say, assuming that the cognitive abilities of the dog could rise to understanding all the medical issues that I've presented. But you can look at the dog's interest to some extent. And so the argument might run, and has run to some degree, if the treatment of the dog is not painful, and if the likelihood of success is high, then economics should not drive your decision. That would seem to say that in the minds of some people who are extrapolating from present conditions to possible legal theory, that you should take the animal to the, this veterinarian and allow for this kind of uh, treatment to be presented. I don't have $100,000, you say, okay? That's where it becomes difficult. The veterinarian should certainly cut down his or her fees to make this more practical the medical facilities that are going to provide the testing and uh, the use of very expensive equipment should also be willing to cut their expenses, so it is argued. And you should go ahead with this. Now, suppose, despite all that, you can't do it. You get the price down to 50000 but you're still, it's still not possible for you to raise the money, and it's, it's just, it's, it's going to ruin you. The guardianship theory 
is thorny. And one of the reasons why it's thorny is what happens if a neighbor who does have more money than you comes in and says, you know, it's right. The relationship should not be one of ownership. It's guardianship, and you're not a good guardian because you can't do this. I would be a better guardian. Goes into court for an order to show cause as to why he should not be appointed the guardian. The law is conservative, and part of the reason why it's conservative is not just because so many members who practice it are Republicans, but also because the law is always thinking in the back of its head, if you can imagine the law having an intelligence, which I know is a matter of some debate. But if you, you think of it, that the law is always concerned that the seamless web of the law is going to have an effect over here that isn't predicted over here. And I think that's the, uh, the reason why jumping into some of these legal theories is a little bit problematic. There are, on the other hand, things that are happening in between the two extremes that I've just portrayed. But I'm suspecting that I'm hitting up against my time, or so you'll have to ask me questions, or <laughs> somebody. Yeah, <laughs> Well, I could keep going. I, I thought no, I thought I was. No, we wanted to get Dr. Lindemeyer Meyer speaking, and then we will ask you questions. Then you will start it back. We presented this scenario, <laughs> and now we will delve into it. Oh, okay. Jennifer first contacted me to, to come there. I tried to talk her out of it because I come from a very different world than um, Dr. Trout or um, John Ensney or so, um, but she persisted. So I took this as an opportunity to, to think about things in a way that I'm not used to thinking about them and to apply some of the work that I do to this question. And I was encouraged to go out on a limb with my thoughts about it, and I did, and I ended up falling out of the tree, and you'll hear the consequences of that. So what I'd like to do is to start, um, I know Dr. Trout is at Angel Memorial Animal uh, Center, and I, uh, when I was a veterinary medical student at Tufts, we, this was before we had the foster hospital out in North Grafton, and so I did my, my rotations, some of them at Angel Memorial. And there was a case that I saw as a fourth year veterinary medical student that has stuck with me through the years. And when I was asked to do this presentation tonight, I thought about it immediately. So I'd like to just relate to you what happened that night um, at Angel Memorial and um, use that as a way to open up the discussion or, or to, to um, convey some thoughts to you about how this relates to some of the work that I do. So. I was a fourth year student at Angel, and one evening there was a very elderly woman who came in uh, from Dorchester. She brought her dog with her. The dog was quite ill. It was, uh, I think, around an eight-year-old dog, and um, the dog had pyometra, which is an infection of the uterus. So we saw the dog, and the attending veterinarian recommended that that dog have surgery that night. And sadly, this elderly woman lived in the top floor of a three-decker in Dorchester. Her husband had died many years ago. Her children had not been in contact with her for years. And this was the only contact, the only relationship that she had in, in the world. The, referring, uh, the, the uh, attending veterinarian recommended the surgery. And the cost of the surgery at the time, this was 1985, was $250, which she, this woman did not have. And so um, we ended up putting that dog down that night. And uh, it was, as I said, it was a, a case that stuck with me for many, many years. So you might think that that's the story of one woman and one dog, and that's where we ought to leave it. But I'd like to go out on a limb with this and take a somewhat broader perspective of the whole relationship and uh, and. and what rights and what responsibilities did we all have that evening towards that woman and her dog? 
Before I do that and incorporate some of my work in public health and public service, I'd like to just address the question for a moment, which is what right do our pets have to be saved? On what do we base the decision and who decides? And I will preface the rest of my remarks by saying that from my perspective, I would agree with John Ensminger that, um, first of all, as we talk about rights, as we apply them to people, certainly, rights are universal. And you all know what those rights are, the right to free speech. Um, some people would argue that there's a right to health care, a right to, to clean water. Um, but they're not without limits. And you all know the classic case of crying fire in a crowded theater. Um, uh, those rights bump up against other people's rights um, and against other kinds of um, concerns. So. The thing about rights, though, is that they apply. If we have a right, it doesn't apply just to one person or one group of, per of people, but it applies across the human species. So I would like to suggest that as we talk about the rights of an animal to be treated, rights cannot apply here because we're not talking about applying them across all animals. We're certainly not talking apl about applying them even across all dogs. So we're talking about applying them in the context of a relationship where uh, an individual, a human owner, has an animal companion. Uh, but there are many other dogs, obviously, dogs that are strays in shelters, um, um, even livestock or wildlife, if we're going to extend it to other species of animals. And so I would suggest that if we can't extend it to all members of that species, that we can't call it a right any longer. But if there is a right in a situation such as this, I would say and suggest that it's the right of the animal, whether it's a pet or not, to have, or just to have minimal pain and suffering where that pain and suffering is recognized by a human being. And in that relationship, there is a contract between the human being and the animal. And the right of the animal to not suffer un unnecessary pain and suffering also implies that there is a responsibility of that person to minimize that pain and suffering where it exists. I think that applies certainly to the shelter dog that's unadoptable. Uh, that animal has a right to a painless death. I think it applies in the case of laboratory animals that uh, for whatever reason, uh, whatever experiment is being done, they have a right not to have unnecessary pain and suffering attend the, the conduct of that experiment. I think it extends to the rights of livestock uh, not to, or to, to uh, be slaughtered with minimal amount of pain and suffering, and probably many of you know the work of Temple Grandin around this issue. So if we accept that that might be considered to be a right of dogs, then I think we ought to consider that there's a right that people have, or a responsibility that people have, um, to minimize that pain and suffering. So that's the right that I want to talk about now. And now I'm going to turn to my experience from years of in public health and public service. At one time, and many years ago, and in many places, the definition of public health confer referred only to physical health and possibly mental health of individ individuals and populations. But what many of us don't know, um, and what a definition that's very little applied in the public health arena, is the WHO, the World Health Organization definition of health, which is written in the preamble to the constitution of the WHO it's, and signed by the International Health Conference in July of 1946 and entered into force on April 7, 1948. And I just want to read that to you. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And for purposes of this discussion, I'd like to place the emphasis on the word social well-being and ask the question whether social well-being of people applies only to people or can we extend that to the animals that we live with. And as evidence of the extension of that to animals, I'd like to cite the Pets Act, which many of you may know about, the Pets Evacuation and Transportation Standards Act, which was a bipartisan initiative in the United States House of Representatives that required states seeking federal emergency management agency assistance to accommodate pets and service animals in their plans for evacuating residents facing disasters. It was introduced by Congressman Tom Lantos and Christopher Shays uh, in September of 2005 and passed by the House of Representatives in 2006 by a margin of 349 to 29. 
It was signed into law by President Bush in October 2006 and is now Public Health Law 109-308. This bill was initiated in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina when the abandonment of many thousands of pets and other animals brought the matter of animal welfare to national attention. And the bill's primary proposer, uh, Congressman Lantos, indicated that a press picture of a child being separated from his dog was the bill's catalyst. And to quote him, the dog was taken away from this little boy and to watch his face was a singularly revealing and tragic experience. This legislation was born at that moment. He explained a little bit more fully in the congressional record. Personally, I know I wouldn't have been able to leave my little white dog to a fate of almost certain death. As I watched the images of the heartbreaking choices the Gulf residents had to make, I was moved to find a way to prevent this from ever happening again. Now, the bill was put in, is, it was was put into law, it was passed, and is now a matter of public policy, although it provides no money to communities that include pets in their disaster preparedness plans. But it does establish that the social well-being of people can apply to the relationship that they share with their animals. Um, I'd also like to briefly expand on this, and I'm happy to answer more questions about it, but to include a um, recent experience recent experience with um, a topic called One Health, uh, which is related to some of the work that I do in global health. And it's not a new idea, but what it is is a recognition that the health of animals, people, and the environment is all interrelated. As an illustration, one of my colleagues, um, someone I don't like too much, um, <laughs> said that if I had to kill all the animals in the world to keep one person healthy, I'd do it. This clearly overlooks the fact that if we were to kill all the chickens in the world um, to avert an avian influenza pandemic, that many poor families all, uh, all around the world would lose valuable sources of protein and income that could pay for needed drugs, feed families, and send children to school. However, One Health is being applied globally to reinforce the interdependence of people, animals, and the environment. So I'd just like to put that out there for later discussion, and I'd like now to return to the elderly woman from Dorchester. She had a social bond with her dog. We don't know what happened to her after her dog was euthanized, but it's my suspicion from seeing her that she had some hard times. She may have stopped taking care of herself. She may have decided that life wasn't worth living any longer. Although it's often argued that she alone was responsible to bear the, bear the cost of that surgery, which she could not afford. Um, and, or if she could not, she also was responsible for bearing the consequences of living without that dog it could be argued that it is in society's interest to pay the cost of the surgery, which at that time was $250, both to keep the dog alive and to keep that animal in her social network. The dog did not have the right to be treated. It only had a right to humane death. The woman had the responsibility to assure painless death, and she did. But did we, as a society, have the responsibility to help her keep her social network such as it was intact? Thank you. Once upon a time, a few of my clients might take me aside and in order to convey the gravity of the situation, whisper, she's like my child. These days, the majority boldly assert, she is my child, the telltale terminology of so-called pet parents, their biological children reduced to pet siblings, forced to accept the fact that their furry little brother or sister never has to leave the security of mom and dad's bed. We spend $40 billion a year on our pets, and a whopping 73% of pet owners said they are willing to go into debt to provide medical treatment. 93% of owners said they thought it likely that they would risk their own life for their pet. Nearly 50% of owners think their pet listens better than their spouse, and if stranded on a desert island and forced to choose only one companion, more people would pick a pet than a human. <laughs> These days, pet owners visit a veterinarian twice as often as they would their own doctor. And regardless of your feelings on the matter, there is no denying the fact that companion animals have moved from the periphery of the American family to its core in a love affair that has shifted the paradigm from accessory to necessity, from mere pet 
to the status of adopted child. No wonder more American households have pets than children. Irrespective of whether it's a dog or a child, owners of, or parents of the sick want cures. Essentially, as a veterinarian, I am being asked to restore or prolong the bond we humans share with animals. We want the advances in our own health care to be available to our animals. In the last 20 years, MRI, CAT scans for pets have become routine. Today, veterinarians perform open heart surgery and renal transplants, provide joint replacements, prosthetic limbs, anti-cancer vaccines, gene therapy, and set up cancer patients for chemotherapy and radiation therapy. There is nothing medically inappropriate or experimental about these treatments. Veterinarians are not the purveyors of false hope. However, it is essential for me to take a big step backwards and ask myself, is this the right thing to do for this animal? That we can offer and do all these things is not tantamount to saying we should do all these things. Rarely, an owner will ask me to do something that I believe to be misguided or verging on animal cruelty. That's an easy call. For the most part, our discussions and our decisions are far more tricky. Consider this scenario. In walks an eight-year-old Bernese mountain dog called Moses. Eight years is a good age for a Bernese mountain dog, but Moses has bone cancer. He needs an amputation. Do you have a problem with a three-legged dog? Do you think dogs look in mirrors and worry about being spurned at cocktail parties? <laughs> Hopefully your answer is no, but consider this. If I do nothing, Moses will live about five months. If I do an amputation, Moses will live about five months. To make a difference in Moses' lifespan, I need to add chemotherapy. And I need to tell you that if we do add chemotherapy to that amputation, 50% of dogs will live for one year, and 20% of dogs will live for two years. Does that change the way you think about Moses? Do you still want to go forward? Remember, this is doggy time. For some owners, an extra week with their beloved pet would be a blessing. For others, anything less than a year is wholly unacceptable. For Moses' owner, she told me to go ahead, and we did the surgery, we added the chemotherapy, and Moses did great. And then a year later, two golf ball-sized masses were located in Moses' lungs. Do we stop at that point? Do we say enough is enough? The scientific evidence suggests that we could do another surgery, and this owner insisted that I do. I was a little uncomfortable with that decision, but I did it, and at the end of the day, Moses lived another year beyond that. And that's a whole lot of living in doggy time. Had I been proved wrong? And before you think that Moses' owner was clearly one of those people who just couldn't let go, consider the fact that in the end, some two years after the original diagnosis, Moses drunk, jumped out of her pickup truck, broke another bone due to the cancer that had spread to another bone. And in this instance, the owner never hesitated to put the dog to sleep. I cannot lose sight of the fact that my first responsibility is to the animal. I need to provide the owner with accurate and current information so they can make their most informed decision possible. But I do that knowing that, for the most part, I'm not privy to all the personal variables in their complex decision. The owner might have very specific and justifiable thoughts on the handling of terminal illness in a loved one. They may have thoughts on natural death versus euthanasia, previous experiences of loss, social isolation, and sadly, not least, that awkward thing called money. Where necessary, I might mention some of the concerns of the respected philosopher and veterinary ethicist, Dr. Bernard Rollins. Rollins points out that as humans, for the most part, we can understand and endure short-term negativity for long-term gain. However, we have no reason to suppose our pets are the same. Our pets are trapped in the now. We have no reason to believe an animal can comprehend the notion of extended life. Therefore, we must be able to justify the merits of what it takes to help our pets and the outcome we hope to achieve. 
Probably my greatest hope in our discussion is that I will get asked the time-honored question, what would you do if this were your animal? At last, I'm being invited to use my experience and personal feelings to help sway a decision in either direction. Believe me, I appreciate the power and the weight of this responsibility, but as always, I am siding with the patient I am sworn to protect, even if that protection comes in the form of mercy and the ultimate alleviation of pain and suffering. Finally, as pet owners, I believe we probably have our most difficult, painful, and greatest responsibility to our animals as they approach the end of life. For you and I, one in five of us will die in a hospital ICU. 20 to 30% of the money spent on what is done to us will be worthless, our way of preventing natural death. As humans and pet owners, I believe there is something worse than dying, and that is dying badly and suffering. We need to accept that we are all mortal. We fail our pets if we delude ourselves, act irrationally, and try to keep them alive, not for them, but for us. Think about it. How many times have you been to a funeral and the body in the casket bears no resemblance to the person you so desperately want to remember? In the end, it comes down to this. Quality of life may be difficult to define, but denial is always a fair weather friend. Thank you so much. The three of you have presented such great viewpoints on this topic. And you helped me with the legal definition of dogs. A dog is legally worth no more than a couch, right? In most legal contexts, a, a dog is going to be assigned fair market value. Damages awards in most uh, courts are still determined by fair market value. However, that that is one of the areas where I think there is substantial change going on. It began, I believe, with the uh, service and police dogs, where uh, various legislatures decided that it was inappropriate to allow fair market value to determine what kind of award the person who lost the animal should get. And they started to dis discuss and apply damage awards that would include veterinary expenses and replacement costs. And when you talk about a service dog that, uh, say a guide dog, you may be talking $50,000 these days. You're talking tens of thousands of dollars. And, and police dogs, some of the police uh, dogs that are now being trained for uh, scent identification work. This, this can be a year, year and a half of training procedures, so the dog gets killed in the line of action. It's, uh, it's no longer just fair market value, but that is the fundamental rule. You're correct. Um, Dr. Lyndon Meyer, I'd like to ask you too about flea and tick medicine. I mean, flea and tick medicine affects all of us, right? Um, so there are public health issues that start with the dog. And there was a story out of, of Britain, I think a year ago, about a, it had been detected a dog with SARS, warning people not to sleep with their dogs because there could be something passed from human to pet. How concerned should we be for these things with our, our pets? Let's just talk about the pet now. Or all dogs as they fit into the ecology of the population. But let me just clarify, let me just um, ask for a little clarification. Do you mean how concerned should we be for the dog or how concerned should we be for the owner? Well, right now I'm speaking for everybody. <laughs> um, I'm speaking for the dog and the owners. Okay. There are uh, many conditions that affect both dog and owner, and I would suggest it's not just things like parasites and, in, and infectious diseases, of which many are emerging, um, but also conditions such as uh, common environment. You know, 
a, a, an, an animal that is overweight or obese is likely to have an owner that is overweight or obese. And, and the, uh, the underlying reason may be there is no safe place to walk. So it extends way you know, beyond the obvious kinds of things, but I'd like to, to answer that with reference to a case of uh, an elderly couple who had, he had diabetes, and because his hospitalizations, and I, he had some procedures, and um, he developed MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus, which can be a very dangerous condition and is, is quite common in our hospitals, long-term care home facilities, and actually is increasingly common in very medical facilities as well. We're increasingly recognizing it in animals. And he was treated for, his, for, the, for the MRSA, and he developed it again, he cleared and then developed it again, and um, was treated again, and there were about three cycles of this, until finally someone asked him, about his situation at home, and in fact, he had a dog at home. And the dog was found to be colonized, not infected. In fact, the dog had, uh, it had been transmitted from the human owner to the dog, and when the dog was treated, he cleared finally. So there's clearly um, many, many instances where there are, consider them, they could be considered to be individual health problems or public health problems in some cases. And um, probably the most well-known and the one which has a huge amount of support in the public health community is rabies. And when right. you think about that, that's a great example of uh, our practicing veterinary medical community collaborating very closely with public health. Public health has taken that on in this country such that we have less than, we have about 1.4 cases of rabies in humans in the United States every year, and it's not from dogs. It tends to be from bats. But I work, for example, with a veterinarian, the director of the Sierra Leone Animal Welfare Society, who is one of six veterinarians in that country and one of only two practicing veterinarians, if you can imagine that. He is located in, in Freetown, which has 300,000 stray dogs. And the people there love their dogs, and yet they can't. Rabies vaccinations are hardly available. And even if there were enough, there would not be enough veterinarians to administer them. Wow. So, you know, it, it's not an easy topic, but there are many, many uh, public health issues for which there is not sufficient support on either the part of the medical community, the public health community, or the animal owner. Um, to, to deal with those. You brought up up there, I just want to say this, that you brought up up there um, Katrina and what Katrina showed us. I mean, what right do you, your pet, what right do your pets have to be saved? I mean, that was a classic situation. But yet, that's a classic public health situation. I mean, do you put people and dogs together in an evacuation shelter? I mean, there are, many people would say, no, you don't do that, that the people go first. Um, uh, people, there are many people that don't like animals and don't want to be around an animal and believe that they have medical conditions that might be exacerbated by an animal, so. No, and, and I think, you know, that's, that to me is the, is a great example of public policy that was made in recognition of that relationship. Just, if I could just have one, a few more comments on that. There was an article in, um, in, a, in a veterinary medical journal several years ago that asked the question, it was, the topic of it was veterinary medicine and the lifeboat test. And the premise was that the human population is on the Titanic and we're about ready to hit the iceberg. And that veterinary medicine as it is currently practiced, that is largely, at least in the United States, uh, uh, pet medicine. And the premise was that when the lifeboats were deployed, veterinarians, as they currently are engaged in practice, will not be invited into the lifeboats. Physicians will be invited in, educators will be invited in, researchers will be invited in, but veterinarians will not. And I think what I learned from Hurricane Katrina is that not only is, is not that they won't be invited into the lifeboats, but that people won't get into the lifeboats if they can't bring their animals with them. Yeah. And that is the real public health issue. Dr. Trout. Um, in this book, which I enjoyed reading 
I mean, it was hard to read it, but it was very, um, I enjoyed it. Love is the best medicine. There is a story in the book about a dog that faced a cataclysm in Bermuda and was flown up to Massachusetts to be dealt with. Obviously, the people that can come to you and that can bring their animals to you for healing and help are people that have the money to do so. Mm-hmm. How involved are you with, or is this all screened before they get to you, the ordinary folk like the woman that um, Dr. Linda Meyer talked about? And how involved do you get with these um, patients? Uh, I am ex- extremely worried about the future of veterinary medicine in terms of um, veterinary healthcare becoming a first class and coach service. Um, we're faced every day with uh, offering um, degrees of quality of, of care. For example, once upon a time, um, for dogs with hip arthritis, there was only a few, um, probably equine mainly related uh, anti-inflammatory drugs that you could give. Um, these days, we think about doing hip replacements and hip modifying surgeries. And there are a whole sort of cascade of different alternatives that get less and less and less and the quality gets less and less and less. They're, they can work very well, but they're not quite as good. And what worries me is that as we drive all these advances and want more and more, we are saying that um, we want more and more so long as we can pay for it. And you know, it's going to become common knowledge that certain, um, certain treatments are the sort of standard of care, and yet you know, Joe average person in the street can't afford it. And I, I look to some extent to the UK because of the success there of health insurance for pets in the United States, only one to three percent. Can you explain that? Yeah, I, w- why it's successful in the no, UK? No, no, no. What do they offer there? So um, I have tried to define this from colleagues in the UK, but it, it seems as though um, it is not like health insurance. Uh, for humans in, in, in the US. It's um, third party, it's, it's uh, outside of the veterinarian, you pay a certain fee, you get a certain amount. But many of the uh, referral hospitals, the bigger hospitals over there, have come to sort of basically say, if we're seeing you, you really need insurance because you're going to thank us for it. And compared to the system in the United States, it seems like you get a lot more bang for your buck. Uh, a lot of uh, you know, middle class and uh, low income families can actually get on board with this and be able to offer a higher quality of health care to their animal than they otherwise, otherwise might. But it's, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. This is just getting worse and worse. And um, it's great that we can offer these things, but, and it's great that people want animals in their life for as long as possible, but that does come at a price. But what a horrible choice that you make. What a Solomon decision you have to make. Yeah. Um, your, your dog or $10,000. Yeah. I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? Uh, in some instances, it really does, yes. Um, and your it's cat inter- or $10,000. Well, it's interesting that you know, people talked about how the veterinary industry had been able to ride out the economic downturn. But if you talk to the people in the trenches in the emergency rooms, they'll tell you that, yes, we're seeing the same number of animals coming through the hospital, but we're increasing the number of euthanasias because people are not able to do that. I mean, I have other crazy things. A couple of months ago, um, I did eye surgery on a guinea pig. And I know you're smiling, but, um, and the, the total bill for this animal was around $1,000. Mine was just a small portion of that bill, but it was genuine, you know, there was a lot of done, a lot of uh, medical management. And it, it later turned out that the, the owner, um, at follow-up, the animal was doing great, but she confessed that she was unable to pay a mortgage that month. Wow. And I would say, you're risking your family for a guinea pig? 
to me, something was off. Now she justified it, she took that responsibility. If I'd have been the person who'd been talking to her at the time, I might have said, you know what? We're talking roof overhead. Let's get that right first. How do you even know that a guinea pig has eye problems? That running into the <laughs> Someone wall? tells me it has an eye problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, just, it's just such a hard thing to think about this kind of money thing. But um, have you had a situation that... Can you tell us a happy story so that we're not... Uh, I mean, can you tell us a story where... Uh, people might expect the worst, but it turns out that the animal is more resilient than they might think. Yeah, I mean, all the time. All the time. Yeah. That's good. Time. I mean, I, I, I get to the point where um, I, I kind of lose, lose track of, of those kind of stories. Um, but I just want to know one thing. That dog that had the back legs a cartwheels yeah. you know, that has two legs and then a cartwheel that I saw on the street recently. Uh -huh. Is that dog a happy dog or is that dog just the same beliefs that it has two back legs? I think, I think that's, I mean, that's a, that's a very difficult issue. Um, I think that dog is a happy dog if the person who lives with that dog is invested in what it's going to take to make that a happy okay. dog. Okay, got I it. think there are a lot of moments when there will be genuine happiness where this I don't even think about my back end but going into that you have to realize that you're becoming a serious caregiver for this animal and if you're not then you are not serving this animal appropriately we're going to take your questions so if you have them uh, please come up and ask um, a question uh, And there must be more questions than me, but uh, okay. Well, one next yeah. Okay, uh, I'd like to take up this important point that uh, if uh, if we can't extend the rights to all animals, then it's not a right. Okay. Last year, according to the uh, American Pet Product Supply uh, Manufacturers Association, Americans spent forty five point five billion dollars on pets. Okay, that's twenty five times as much as the one point seven billion that we spend on protecting endangered species. Uh, also, you can look at another uh, fact that according to the Humane Society, hunters killed 100 million <laughs> wildlife last year while shortening their lives while we were trying to extend the lives of dogs and cats. And finally, dogs and cats kill a lot of wildlife. Uh, there are no statistics kept on that, but there was a survey in Germany last year that, that estimated that there were seven million creatures killed by dogs and cats in that year alone, and that's a small country with much less uh, wilderness area than in the United States. So we tend to take, I'm not a dog lover, I'll admit right from the start, but, <laughs> but I do care a lot about endangered species, and, and biodiversity is the second worst environmental problem facing us next to global warming. And it seems to me, if we don't get over our anthropocentrism in our regard to other living creatures, then we get far, far more important problems than whether a dog lives another year or not. I mean, I'm not trying to take away from people that like dogs, but let's put this into perspective. Well, you bring up an interesting point about biodiversity, and uh, Dr. Lyndon Meyer, this seems tailor-made for you to answer. Yeah, I, I actually would like, and, and that's the reason why I brought up this whole One Health it's an approach, and I could speak on that at great length, but... Um, it, it is a recognition that we're all uh, related. I, I will say somewhat unfortunately, the way it's being applied is only to emerging infectious diseases and almost only to emerging infectious diseases from wildlife. Um, a lot of effort is going into protecting people from those diseases that wildlife carry where I'd like to see, the, and, 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 and actually as a consequence of that, what we have are human sentinels for wildlife diseases. Because as it turns out, about 75% of the emerging infectious diseases that affect people come from wildlife. So that's why the focus on wildlife. Where I'd like to see this go is to emphasize 
In addition to emphasizing the responsibility of the veterinary medical community and other health professionals, including nurses and, and physicians and public health, for to protect people from those diseases, I would frankly like to see the responsibility in medical schools and public health schools, that responsibility to care for the environment. Because right now it seems to me to be a very one-way conversation. It, it's all about what can all other health professionals do to keep people healthy? And I'm not saying that's not a reasonable goal, but if we're going to ask that question, and if we're truly inter interrelated, the health of all is interrelated as it is in a spider web, then public health and human medicine has a corresponding responsibility to care for the environment, for wildlife, for all of those species, and I don't really see that happening. Right so now. you don't feel like in a veterinary school, now here you are, animal doctors, and you bring up, well, the, the questioner brought up a very interesting point about all animals, all wildlife. You know, we focus on pets. We focus on the cute, fluffy, and, the, and you know, the, the kitty. Do you, do you think that veterinary schools give enough attention to the biodiversity, as the questioner referred to it? Certainly Tufts does, and Tufts was one of the, was the first veterinary medical school in the country, and perhaps even in the world, to start a wildlife clinic and a wildlife medicine program. We have a wildlife medicine um, internship. So, that, so that there is an acknowledgement. Very, uh, it is one of our signature programs at Tufts, so uh, I don't know if, you've, if, you, if that makes you feel better, um, but other schools are starting to do the same, and, and I, I wish things were further along. But again, it can't just be the veterinary medical community that's addressing these issues. It has to be all health professionals. Because even if we don't know that there's a disease lurking out there that might come from bats or Gambian rats or whatever it is, and it, you know, that we, sh we should still be doing something about that because we all share this planet. I mean, I understand that there are limited resources. And it shouldn't be just because, ultimately, if a disease arises in, others, in another species of animal, that it will come around and bite us. But we should, my personal feeling, now this is my personal feeling, so we should do it because I think we do have a responsibility to be stewards. And I would really like to see more balanced discussion about the various healths, not just the health of people. Yes, you have a question? Yes, hi, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, my name is Rob Nager, and I am the owner of a dog walking and pet sitting business. I've got a question for Mr. Ensminger, and if I can have a follow-up for Dr. Trout. Um, talk about the value of a dog being a piece of property, a couch, et cetera. Um, are people starting to sue when a pet is lost uh, for uh, pain and suffering or any kinds of emotional damages as well as coverages, uh, medical costs, etc.? Yes. And some courts have recognized this, uh, though usually the circumstances are extreme, beyond negligence. A case that I read about concerned a woman whose dog was barking at a garbage man. Garbage man may have been a little bit off his rocker or something. He picks up the garbage pail, throws it at the dog, injures the dog badly enough that several hours later it has to be put down. That isn't the end of it, though. He begins to then jump up and down, laugh, and point at the woman, enjoying the frustration and pain she is showing. The court found that this was an egregious enough situation and probably, I would guess, felt that it read so horribly that the court was not concerned about appellate decisions overturning this perspective and awarded damages for uh, uh, the emotional distress involved. The, the, the pet did not have any substantial value in terms of breed value or service dog value. So, yes, it's starting to happen. I, you read a lot of cases where judges are saying, look, legislature, 
give us more ammunition here, change the laws, and some states have done that, have, have provided, uh, some jurisdictions have provided for uh, higher levels of damages. It's, it's a fledgling movement, but I think it's going to catch on. I think it's going to catch on in part because of this family connection, this feeling that, that these pets are distinguishable from livestock where uh, horse, cattle, sheep, and pigs, and my father was in that industry his entire life, where these are commodities traded as property and valued as property and even subdivided uh, into derivatives uh, uh, as property, pork bellies, uh, looking at my friend who's a tax lawyer in the audience, you know, that this, this is a, 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 it makes sense as a commodity, your companion animal doesn't. And I think that there's an increasing judicial recognition. Uh, I'd like to see it get stronger, but I think it's happening. I do think that is going to change. It's a bit frightening to think about, you know, as Dr. Trout was talking about, the cost of medical procedures uh, continues to increase and the first and second class uh, type of care. I don't know if veterinary uh, professionals have to have um, malpractice insurance or not, but I, I would assume that if this movement continues, that that's probably gonna come on board and, and costs will be. Very interesting. I, I was trying to avoid that yeah. in order to keep some level of comity on the panel here. <laughs> Sorry. <It> was, <laughs> The issue is there, I think it's fair to say that the, the veterinary profession and the AVMA and, and other subgroups of veterinarians are not of one mind on this. And, and one can read, uh, I think there's an AVMA statement from something like 2002, which cautions about the results of the guardianship uh, uh, approach. And, I, and I, I understand this and I accept it because Veterinary negligence uh, leads to sufficiently small awards that veterinary malpractice insurance, as far as I know, is still relatively inexpensive. Your, your, a good portion now of your cost in going to a physician relates to the fact that he's paying a hell of a lot of malpractice insurance, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, whereas I think for veterinarians, what is it, two, three thousand a year? I have to have lots of malpractice insurance. But it's still, uh, I think it's, uh, I, I, I think my statistics and my notes are a little old, but it's, it's, no, it's a fraction of what it is. And so that's, that's, that's a problem. It's one of the, the issues that comes up when you talk about, uh, you talk about valuation. The, the, other, the other point is um, that there's a concern about the need to practice defensive medicine that if, um, you know, we're already very aware of the cost of veterinary care, you add uh, more malpractice insurance, then that cost is gonna go somewhere, probably the client's gonna pick that up, the veterinarian's gonna be having to, to act a little bit more cautiously, and will your animal's health care suffer as a consequence? I've also heard that the internet uh, is the enemy of the veterinarian, not the, not the enemy, but that more and more patients are going to the internet, looking up things on the internet, going to the veterinarian, loaded with all this information, quote unquote. So that that is, thank I, you. Did you have a question I, for I Dr. do, Trent? but I, th there's other people. Maybe at the end, if there's time, I'll, I'll come back for a follow-up. Okay, okay. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Jerome. I already spoke to Monica and um, John. But um, this question is kind of for whoever wants to answer it. Um, it's kind of a situation that might awkwardly word a question. Um, so my dog is epileptic, um, and I'm is what is epileptic. So epileptic. He's seizures whenever we take him to the vet, uh, to the veterinarian. So it's kind of hard, like when he has and he has a constant ear infection. So whenever it bothers him, we have to take it to check it update, um, not daily, but a couple like once a couple times a month, maybe sometimes. Um, so it's kind of hard to take him to the vet because I. I guess he smells something and it just like reacts and he has seizures. Um, so we have difficulties whether we want to take him or not because we don't want him to go through um, another seizure attack. And then there are times where he's, he's had to have um, 
checkups and he's had to stay nights sometimes he, once even a week at an, at, an, at an animal hospital to like find out what was wrong with him um we've never had to have uh, operation or surgery on him like any drastic su- surgery but i just wanted to compare it to recently um my grandmother was in the hospital and um we spent a lot of money for her to for her to be um you know put through care and to have all these tests and stuff and um unfortunately she died but um i want to i want to bring up the question that that uh, family is irreplaceable, whereas dogs, one, if, if someone loses a dog, one can easily go out and buy another dog. Would this be a legitimate reason to maybe put down a dog and then just go out and buy another one? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying, kind of? Uh, you, can I just reword it and tell yeah. me if I'm, if I'm going too far here? No, go on. So you have a dog, your dog is epileptic, your dog has seizures, your dog is constantly in distress. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, your dog also has another medical problem. Uh, constant ear. Oh, constant ear infections. Constant, constant. So you think to yourself, gee, should I just put the dog out of its misery? You begin to think, well, the dog is probably miserable. Should I put the dog out of its misery and try to get a new, healthier dog? Well, not just out of like one day say, oh, I'm going to put him down. If right. he needs, if there's a part uh, in his life where he needs to go through extensive surgery, and it's really expensive uh, to okay. go through the surgery, whereas getting a new dog would be less expensive. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't want, I, don't, I sound like a horrible person, but... <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I think you ask a very legitimate question. You ask, a, you know, you ask something that... Um, okay, yes, give I it mean, a go. I, I would say, I mean, you're almost answering your own question. Certainly, I mean, if you are bringing that up to that level, mm-hmm then the, I mean, there are instances where you could be faced with a terminal illness. What you're describing to me does not sound like it's that severe. Yes, it's frustrating. Um, Yes, it's maybe uh, hard to manage. I think if you told me, you know what, we've we've done all these things, I'm I'm watching an animal who's miserable, who's suffering, then I would say, sure, that's, that's a very viable reason for saying enough is enough. I don't need to see this anymore. But your description of, of sort of an, an animal who has some seizures and some ear problems, I would be sort of saying, well, you know, that's, that's the price you pay when you decide to share your life with an animal. If you don't want to pay that price, then you shouldn't, but someone else might want to. If someone else doesn't want to, it may come down to the same result. But I mean, if you when you take on that animal, that's that's part of the, you know, the silent oath you swear to that animal because that's what it means to have a pet. Mm-hmm. I just thank you. Can I just add make... something too, Monica? Okay, sure. um, the, you know, the, it is possible with low level of certain types of drugs. For example, I have a our, our poodle is has seizures as well, and on a low level of phenobarb. It's perfectly fine. So every day he gets that, and it becomes a simple matter. Then it's it becomes fairly easy to manage. And ear problems similarly, um, you know, perhaps it, you know, your your dog hasn't had the right treatment. Perhaps it's a yeast infection. It's hard to know, but it it does almost sound as though these are chronic problems. That if you found, you know, if if your dog were put on the right drug, that perhaps this wouldn't have to be a chronic problem. So. Um, uh, you need your vet to come yeah. to your house. Yeah. Also, just wanted to kind of like from a veterinarian's perspective, if not even like my dog, if like another dog was serious enough where it had to come down to the put down like kind of uh, scenario or decision, would you suggest that? Like, and do you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't think I'm getting my question out clearly. Like, if it was, if it, if it came down to where someone had to do, had to decide whether to put down their dog. And they asked you, and they were like, well, what would you think? Would it be, would you suggest kind of like, you know, putting down and then maybe suggesting like another dog? Or like, do you know what I mean? Would I suggest so like, like switching straight from one dog to the next? No. Well, like, because, you know, people, like, some for someone who needs companionship, yeah. and their dogs obviously, I, like, you see that it's not going to make it or something. Or in, I think that depends on the individual. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would say the vast majority of pet owners I meet are in emotional turmoil when they lose an animal and you know it's just a reflection of the relationship they've shared and some i know i know some pet owners who've already got the next dog lined up that's part of the 
continuum, if you will. I know others that will just, one, one dies, next day they get another one, and others for whom they will never, ever get another cattle dog. They just can't let them in. The pain is just too, too great. Yeah. I, I remember a couple of years ago meeting a couple, and I could not get through to them that every animal is different. They just couldn't. They, they love dogs. They'd meet them in the street. They, they, they'd love to engage them, but they just couldn't risk doing it again. George Carlin, the late comedian and kind of philosopher, he said, and this has stuck with me, life is a series of dogs, <laughs> which... Thank, Thank you. you for your question. Yes, John, do you have a question? Yes, I do. Hi. Um, I'm thinking about my friends who've gone through chemotherapy. It certainly was extremely difficult and painful and not at all pleasant. So when we speak of giving it to dogs, are we really helping them? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, part of my reason for using that example was shock value, because actually um, uh, side effects and complications in dogs are, are, are fairly uncommon. It's, it's a, I think it's around 20% of dogs will have, uh, you know, the typical things you might expect with chemo, with vomiting, diarrhea, off food, that kind of thing the vast majority of which is very manageable at home. So most, although we have this very human concept of just... Uh, they don't lose their hair. Right, hair loss and misery and just can't face the day for the vast majority of dogs, and not, not all dogs because obviously things can happen, but most dogs do very well with chemotherapy. And actually, just let me interject here, I, I, um, I, I spent several years in West Africa and brought home my two African hounds, and one of them at 13, no, at 11, developed vesicular cell carcinoma in, the, in his bladder. And he went through chemo, and uh, I had two more years with him, and frankly, it was worth it. Hmm. And he, he did fine until the day he crashed. You would not have known that there was anything unusual. Okay, thank you. So, thank you, Joan. Do you have a question? Yes. My question is about the effect of the law passed after Katrina in practice. So. You're, you show up at the evacuation center with your dog, do they have to take your dog? Because I know of somebody in, in New Orleans who basically refused to leave, she risked her life to stay with the dog and she was breaking into her neighbor's houses mm -hmm. to feed every dog in the neighborhood because um, other people had, had left their pets behind but she couldn't face that. <laughs> My understanding is that the law requires that the planning and advanced planning for FEMA and for other organizations like this has to take pet rescue into account. Uh, it does not specify exactly how it would be implemented in individual cases. I'm not sure, I'm not aware of actual litigation following up on any post-Katrina disaster where this has actually reached a court. My guess is as long as the agency has has a plan and has implemented it, uh, is capable of implementing some sort of uh, uh, salvation work for animals that that would be satisfactory. I do know that in Katrina there was one rescue group, group. they were operating on their own and it was, um, I've been in touch with them on other contexts but, but they they have sent me photographs of actual saving uh, of dogs in Katrina, and, and it's all on a website. Uh, if you gave me a card, I could I could find it, but I don't have it uh, uh, on me. But but there has been some effort in this regard. Yes. Do you have a question? Yes, I'd like to talk a little. You to I'd like you guys to address uh, issues surrounding service animals. Uh, um, what, from a public policy standpoint, what responsibility do we have to those animals, uh, partic particularly when these animals are, are owned by, may be owned by people who don't have much money and can't uh, afford curative uh, medical care and when curative medical care may be available? John, you're the expert. There, is, there are a lot of laws designed to protect people with service animals. Uh, it's a sad case that I think 
something on the order of 5% of all guide dogs in this country are taken out of service every year because of attacks by other dogs mm -hmm. or by people who are deranged or hate dogs or something. So it is a very big problem. And if you think about the fact that, that a, a person who is uh, blind or visually impaired it may need six or seven dogs over, over the course of a lifetime and have to adapt to each one of them in sequence, it, it is a good change that now the, the level of liability uh, on the person causing the damage is substantial and, and includes both replacement value and the veterinary costs of the, uh, of the damage done to the, uh, the animal that's going out of service if that's what happens. Uh, I think that these kind of protective laws uh, are going to become more prevalent and more severe. There are damage awards that are uh, also punitive, which don't, and don't, don't just relate to the actual uh, uh, physical damage done and the replacement costs, but can be substantially higher. Uh, there was, uh, and, and there are criminal uh, proceedings uh, the most serious one I know about was, I believe, in the state of Hawaii, where uh, some criminal, in order not to be tracked by two police dogs, he slit their throats. And I think, if I recall correctly, I'd have to look up the case uh, to be exact, but I think he was sentenced to nine years in prison for that. That's a lot more than would have happened a few years ago if you just looked at a fair market value type of punishment for this. Police dogs are also highly protected now. Yeah. I'm, by the way, I'm the proud owner of a service cat. My cat, um, I have to take medication that can sometimes make me cognitively impaired, and my cat alerts me when I'm cognitively impaired. <laughs> so. um, I'd actually like to talk to you for a second afterwards. Are you aware of the new Department of Justice regulations? Uh, that have defined a service animal as a dog or a miniature horse, effectively, but not a cat. I, um, I have registered my, ser my service animal. Mm -hmm. I've done what, I, you know, I've, I've registered my service animal with a couple of organizations. Right. She has ID, she has an ID card. Okay. You know, I've done what, I've done what I can. But from a public policy standpoint, um, sometimes, sometimes, um, sometimes being able to care for, let's say, let's say, so let's say my cat gets sick and I can't pay for the medical care and it's curative, and my cat, um, actually because of what she does, provides benefits to me, proven medical benefits, because. Um, I know when I'm having problems with my own medication. Mm -hmm. And um, what, one of the, um, I'm trying to think of what sort of provisions might be available or, or get people thinking about uh, from a public policy standpoint, would it be worthy, would it be worth it to put money aside somewhere so that blind animals, um, some blind person who's service animal needs a curative treatment and can't afford it, can get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, are, there are organizations that yeah. attempt to do this. Uh, uh, probably not enough. Right. But Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You have a question? I do. Um, I know that there are several um, members of the veterinary community out here, and I'm going to ask this question and sit down and let you guys answer. But um, here's my question. We obviously have a, a lot of owners who um, end the pain and suffering of their pet through humane euthanasia. Um, obviously, that's what we in the veterinary community hope for. But um, as we have grown and found out that owners, uh, you know, just like with their family members, want to keep them around for just as long, we find more and more of these um, people who are not willing to humanely euthanize. I'm just wondering um, what your take is on whether or not it is within an animal's right to receive hospice care, or whether or not it's the right of a veterinarian to, um, prom to give hospice care to these animals. So I'll let you answer. Could you define hospice care? For an animal, 
Dr. Trapp? Um, I mean, uh, we, we have uh, staff members who deal with, uh, I guess what you describe palliative treatment, treatment that is um, extending life but not expecting to achieve a cure, and that extension is always taking into account uh, quality of life. Um, I actually kind of anticipated someone was going to ask something along those lines. And, uh, you know, I've, I remember putting this to the, um, both the AVMA and the Royal Veterinary College to say, you know what, if I decide this animal is suffering, I don't want to put this animal to sleep, what can I do? I mean, can I just say, no, your animal needs to, you know, be euthanized. And um, let me just quote from the uh, Guide to Professional Conduct. Uh, the veterinary surgeon's primary obligation is to relieve the suffering of an animal, but account must be taken not only of the animal's condition, but also the owner's wishes and circumstances. And veterinary surgeons can only advise their client and act in accordance with their professional judgment, which isn't very helpful. Um, and so, my personally, I think, I, I mean, I've had situations uh, recently, a, uh, an owner came in with a two and a half year old Labrador that uh, I thought had a lameness due to an arthritis problem in an elbow. And she was kind of anxious and didn't want to go ahead with the necessary surgery. And uh, I did actually schedule surgery and she never showed up. And we rescheduled and she never showed up. And then about three months later, she suddenly appears and this dog now has a very obvious lump on, on a shoulder. And this lump is a very highly aggressive cancer. And she let me get a biopsy, but then she didn't show up. And by the time I actually saw this case, um, it was, in my opinion, completely inoperable. I said, there is no point in me doing surgery on your animal. And she still wanted me to do surgery. And I said, I'm not prepared to do that. I said, I, sadly, I don't believe we have any viable option for your dog apart from enjoy what life you have, be comfortable, I can certainly make sure of that. Uh, and, I, and I can recommend other surgeons, other facilities that you may want to go talk to uh, because maybe they would be willing to perform a procedure, but I'm not. And I think that's what it you know, comes down to. Um, you know, what, what also was unspoken was the fact that she lost her father from a cancer that had been misdiagnosed and had, and so there's, there's often times this back history. And I think it, you know, as veterinarians, uh, you're, you know, you may be treating animals, but really you're treating people as well. And if you don't engage in that and find out what's motivating you to not put this animal to sleep, to, to insist that you keep this animal in your life, uh, for the most part, you'll discover that um, there's some major reason. And usually, hopefully, you can uh, get to the, you know, the right decision and, and save you know, the animal from suffering. Friends, Dr. Oh. we have five minutes. I just wanted to let you know in okay. case you want to do final final. I want to ask uh, Dr. Trout and Dr. Linda Meyer um, the very gut-wrenching question that I tell you I uh, get a letter to ask Dog Lady occasionally uh, about this. How do I know when the time has come? Um, and I'd like to hear the veterinary perspective on how does a pet owner know when it's time to go see you? I, it, so for the most part, I think if most pet owners are honest, they know. They know. Because, you know. Their pet I, lets I, them know. You know, I had a, uh, an old man came in with a dog with a bone cancer, and this thing was massive, but the dog was running around as though and there was no problem. I couldn't understand it. And he didn't want to go with an amputation. And he, he just said, you know, I'm just going to enjoy what time I have. And I thought, am I going to see you again? Are you going to step up? Are you going to do the right thing? And he did. He came back and said, you know, it's time. Let's do it. 
And uh, I think, I think uh, another guide that I tend to leave with owners is, you know, make a note of all those fun things that your pet does, all those things that let you know that all is well with the world, and jot them down and stick them on the refrigerator and come back to them years later. And when they're not being done by your animal, you'll start to know it's time. Couldn't that just be old age? <laughs> Well, I feel I'm going to burst into tears, so that's why I'm, <laughs> But I just want to, do you have a quick question do you want to ask? A quick one. I don't know if it's uh, common sense or not because I've lost it in my own life, but it seems to me that in order to keep this, like Angel Memorial Emergency Care, it's a scarce resource. There's not that many of those centers where 24 seven you can bring your animal in the middle of the night and there's a surgeon and neurologist on call. And it seems to me there needs to be a certain amount of $1,000 guinea pigs and $15,000 dogs just to keep the place open. But some people think I'm crazy, but it, could you just respond to that? Yeah, I mean, Angel is nonprofit, uh, but it's always a struggle to balance the budget, even when you're charging lots of money. Because there are those cases for which, you know, the bottom line is if an animal comes in and an owner has no money, we're still bound to do the right thing by that animal, even if ultimately it's the alleviation of pain through euthanasia. Um, and we're not looking to do that. We're looking, you know, if you've got an otherwise healthy animal with, yes, you've got a broken leg or whatever, something that can be fixed relatively easily, then we'll, we'll step up and, you know, we're going to incur some of those costs. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's very, it's a very hard issue. At, at, at Tufts, um, we had the $20,000 goose with osteosarcoma, which was an interesting case. Um, but uh, we do have a fund to help people out who can't afford um, the care for their animals, the Travis Fund, and people can make donations to that. My understanding is it's, well, it's never enough, but it's, it's, it's a good source of funding for people who really can't afford the care that their animal needs. That's a very nice way to end this on the note that there is hope, not just for the pets, but for the people who love the pets and care for the pets and maybe can't afford care for their pets. There, is, there are these funds where they can go. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Nick Trout. Dr. Joanne Lindenmeyer, John Lindenmeyer. And I want to say that uh, the books by Nick Trout and John Ensminger are on sale as you leave, if you'd like to get them. And I just want to thank all of you for, the, for talking about this. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.